Well, today we begin a five-part message series I'm calling Vital Signs. And I have been looking forward to this for a long time, actually. I think the uh, inspiration for this message series, if I'm honest, began in the back of an ambulance. A little while back, I was in the back of an ambulance, had a cuff on my arm, a mask on my face, wires coming off my chest, a young man, a paramedic, broadcasting my vital signs on his phone or the radio to the ER department. And I just want you to know I'm fine. I was fine. I was probably just dehydrated or stressed out by something. But after that experience of like fully getting a, a health scan that cost no small penny, the physician recommended that I get a fitness tracker, which I did, and which I love, by the way. I am kind of a gadget geek, and I love the fact that when you ask me how am I doing, I can give you data. <laughs> My wife says, how is your sleep? And I go, I don't know, let me check. And you know, I, I'm up too late, I sleep three hours, and I look at my phone, and I go, oh my gosh, I got like massive REM and deep sleep last night, so I'm good, let's go. <laughs> Even when I don't feel so good. And this all got me thinking, how do I measure my spiritual health, right? I, I know how we can measure our physical health, but how would you measure your spiritual health? What are the vital signs of spiritual health? And how would you track them? And, and how would you try to improve them? Surely our spiritual health matters as much as our physical health, our connection to God, the wellness of our souls, the effects of the spiritual forces around us, our alignment to the unique purpose that God has created each of us for. So how are you doing spiritually? Who knows? I, I didn't know how to answer that. How, how would you answer that question? I might be a spiritual Olympian or I might be a spiritual chain smoker. I don't know. <laughs> well, the Bible can help us uh, uh, with this problem. It can help us understand how we're doing spiritually. Uh, it can help us improve our spiritual health as well. And so that's what this series is about. We're going to be looking at the Bible and we're going to look for five, what I call five vital signs. Uh, and here they are all together. Worship, formation, community, mission, and giving. Worship, formation, community, mission, and giving. Now these aren't New to you, if you've been around here for a while, I, I, I've come to call them the five vital signs of active membership at UPC. These are, these are the promises that we make to Jesus uh, and to one another here at UPC when we become members. We're members of Christ and we're members of one another. Now, if you're not yet sure that you believe, maybe you're new to Jesus or new to UPC or just struggling with your own faith. We're all on a faith journey somewhere along the way. For you, this could just be a nice introduction to the basics of Christianity. For the rest of us, uh, I, I, my prayer for us is that this is a season of renewal, uh, personal renewal and collective renewal for us. And I'm going to invite you to take a step, and I invite myself, take a step closer to Jesus and closer to his church family at UPC. This is a, a, a series about being very intentional in, about how we connect to Jesus and how we connect to one another and, and renewal. Each week, I want to ask you to ask yourself, how am I doing in this particular area, given who I am, given where I am on my own faith journey, given what's happening in my life right now? What's one commitment I can make this fall to deepen my spiritual life? In, in each of these five ways. So that if you would partic participate each week, by the time we get to Thanksgiving, which is just around the corner, you'll have a whole set of, of five commitments to deepen your own spiritual health. And you'll be on your way towards renewal, God willing, spiritual renewal, covenant renewal. All right? So let's begin today with worship. And the good news is you're already doing it. Look at how healthy we are. You're here. Uh, you're already worshiping. Now, worship, as you know, is a central theme in the Bible, especially the New Testament book of Hebrews. So I'd like you to turn, if you would, to, your, to that book in your Bible, to Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. Navigate there on your phone. Of course, we'll put it on the screen as well. But if you're able, would you stand? Let's read God's word aloud together. This is a beautiful invitation to worship. When we're done reading, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, so that if you believe it or are coming to believe it, you can say, thanks be to God. Listen carefully, you're reading God's holy word. Hebrews 10, verse 19 following. 
Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Heaven and earth will pass away, but what we just read never will. Please be seated. Isn't that a great description of worship? I mean, you might just leave it open. This text invites you to worship. Here we read Jesus is a great priest. He leads his people into a sanctuary. Do you see that in verse 1920? A sanctuary or a holy place. Now, this particular holy place the writer's writing about, it's not just the Holy of Holies in the ancient tabernacle or temple in Jerusalem. This is the dwelling place of the holy God in the heavenly realms Jesus is leading us into. And this priest, just this Jesus, he's not just an ordinary priest. He's a great priest. He's not the ordinary priest who would enter into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which was just celebrated uh, as all of Israel gathered outside around the temple. No, this great priest is the very Son of God. He enters into the heavenly places with the blood of his own sacrifice to make final atonement for sin. This curtain, this this is not just the the curtain that protected Israel from God's glory as it hung across the holy place in the ancient uh, temple or tabernacle that was torn, you know, from the top to the bottom when Jesus died. No, this curtain is the very incarnation of our Savior Jesus Christ, his flesh, the text says, his dying and his rising. Jesus made a new way, a new life-giving way, the text tells us. A new way not just to worship outside the tabernacle, but to enter in and to live in the very presence of heavenly glory. The writer speaks of a confidence that is uh, Jesus' people, or, or literally an authorization. We have authorization to enter in to this glory. This is a beautiful description of worship. It's an invitation Jesus invites, notice his followers, he just actually leads his people into this place of worship, into this heavenly sanctuary. And notice what happens when they follow. Look at verses 22 and and 24 as, as the text continues. Their spiritual vitality grows. At the heart of the text is what's in the heart of a believer. Faith, hope, and love, the three great theological virtues they're called. We read in the text of the assurance of faith and a confession of hope and a provocation to love and good deeds, faith, hope, and love. As they worship, they're growing in these things, in the living way of Jesus. So the writer says, participate. You know, gather for worship. Every week, some, we note, are are neglecting to meet together, he says. But don't let that happen. And so, in fact, there are these three invitations in the text. Let us, he says. Let us. Some of you may remember the great New Testament scholar and professor William Lane. He was at SPU for many years, voted most popular teacher. Anyone know, remember William Lane? Uh, Yes, I see hands. Okay, good. Go Falcons, by the way. This is SPU prof. Dr. Lane translates, let us continue to draw near. Let us continue to hold fast. Let us keep on caring for one another. According to Dr. Lane, these believers have a choice. They can either draw near to the heavenly world in worship or they can fall back into the world from which Christ's blood has rescued them. He says the alternative to worship is apostasy. Now many of us learn to worship as college students. I know I did. I've told you before, I didn't grow up in a church family. I was invited to worship first among a small group of my friends who were on the, the rowing team. They were putting together a small group Bible study. They said, George, we're just going to read the Bible together. And so I joined them. We started reading the Bible together and we started praying. Now, for me, that was really weird. We were worshiping. And before long, I, I walked up the street and I found a local church in that town. And 
uh, I just started showing up in the church services on Sunday all by myself. And that was also weird. But they did have donuts, and that kept me alive on Sunday morning. I listened to the sermons. I helped out. I volunteered with a high school a youth group. I uh, met a woman there who took me downtown to a soup kitchen where I began serving on Sundays with her. And I just saw who Jesus was in that community as I worshipped them with them. And in time, that little college kid, full of doubt, full of insecurity, anxiety, false ambition, and also oftentimes, if I'm honest, despair, began to change. I changed through worship. Where there was doubt, I was finding faith. Where there was despair, I was finding hope. Where there was selfish ambition, I was finding love. That little church was provoking me to love and good deeds. And week by week, it was changing me. Jesus was changing me. If I had to use one word to describe the kind of change that I was experiencing at the time, I'd use the word that our writer uses here, confidence, assurance. Confidence not in myself, but in our great priest and in his plan for my life. I know it's not easy being a student, especially today. Remember the mother who wrote a letter to the college president. She writes, Dear sir, my son has been accepted for admission to your college and soon he'll be leaving me. I'm writing to ask that you give your personal attention to the selection of his roommate. I want to be sure his roommate's not the kind of person who uses foul language or tells off-color jokes, smokes, drinks, or chases after girls. She writes, I hope you understand why I'm appealing to you directly. You see, this is the first time my son will be away from home, except for his three years in the Marine Corps. <laughs> right? So let me say a word to you students. If you let Jesus into your worship, you'll find him leading you for a life. If he leads you in your worship, he will lead you through your life. There's a professor named Stephen Garber and he's framed his whole research around one question. How do we help students learn to connect what they believe about the world with how they live in the world? How do we, how do we help students connect that? Stephen Garber. After decades of research, here's his answer. It takes three things. Those who, who will have integrated a meaningful faith with a public life were students who, number one, had formed a worldview sufficient for the challenges of the modern world. Number two, who had found a teacher who incarnated that worldview. And number three, who had forged friendships with folks whose common life was embedded in that worldview. The convictions, a mentor, and community. Those three things will help a student, and I would say the rest of us as well, integrate what we believe about the world with how we live in the world. And those three things are exactly what you should find when we gather here for worship week after week. I just heard a story that made my heart sing. Last week, two of our staff, they interviewed some college students, two young women, to, they, they came and said, we'd like to volunteer with your family ministry at UPC. And they were like, wow, how did this happen? And they said, well, we were in the sanctuary last Sunday. This is just last Sunday. We were in the sanctuary. And that's like, what an answer to prayer. They were here and they said, yeah, we'd like to serve. And they said, well, why would you do that? And they said, well, I mean, what brought you to UPC? And they said, well, we've been, we'd visited another church in the U District and all we saw there were students. And they said, we just didn't see a future for ourselves there. See, see, we'd like to be a part of a church that when we get married and when we have kids, that we can still participate at that church. And she said, we, we've, we've seen that there are people who've been at this church for decades and we want to be a part of it. Wow, that's amazing. That is exactly who we are at UPC. And that's what we're praying the Lord will continue to do in our midst. Help us, as our, I say, one of our values is growing with students. And as you know, this church was planted right here precisely so that college students could worship Jesus. The sooner you gather to worship as a weekly discipline in your life, the more faith, hope, and love are not just beliefs, but a way of life, a living way. Jacques Ellul, the French philosopher, said it well. He's, he's riffing a little bit on Ecclesiastes 12 when he writes, Remember your creator during your youth when all the possibilities lie before you and you can offer all your strength intact for his service. The time to remember is not after you become senile and paralyzed, thinking of me. Then it's not too late for your salvation, 
but too late for you to serve as the presence of God in the midst of the world and the creation. You must take sides earlier when you can actually make choices, when you have many paths opening at your feet before the weight of necessity overwhelms you. It's interesting advice from Ecclesiastes, really. Make good choices early. Worship your creator during your youth. I started worshiping as a college student. And now I'm, I'm 58 years old and I look back on a lot of life and I realize that the convictions that have shaped my life were the convictions that God gave me right at that moment in college, at my conversion. Convictions like the gospel is the key that unlocks the human soul. Convictions like God speaks today through the Bible, it's his word. Convictions like the Holy Spirit has a daily adventure for each and every one of us. Like the church is God's plan for the redemption of the world. These convictions have shaped my life. Who I married, where I live, what I did. I, I wouldn't be who I am today if it weren't for these fundamental convictions. And they all came through worship. See, Jesus leads us into worship. I mean, this is not just for college students. It's for all of us. Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Psalm 150 says, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Psalm 95 says, oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are his people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. St. Paul says, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, your whole life, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, he writes, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is the, his good, acceptable, and perfect will. That's Romans 12. So what we're learning in these verses, is it's a vital sign. Worship. It's a vital sign. If you can measure your practice of worship, you can measure your spiritual growth. It becomes a proxy. But it's more than just a measure of growth. It's actually a means of growth. It's a gift that God gives you to heal you, to renew you, to strengthen you, to encourage you, to commission you, to transform you, to grow you in faith, hope, and love. I talk to a lot of people these days who are struggling with their faith. One of the things I like to ask them is, well, tell me about your worship practice. And they go, huh? Because I think we think of our worship practice as something we should do after we figured out our faith. But not the Bible. The Bible says faith comes through hearing. Paul's talking about worship. I mean, even doubting Thomas eventually finds faith. And how does he find it? Well, Thomas, if you know the story, he hung out with the disciples. Even after he said, I don't believe what you believe. He didn't share their faith. He didn't embrace their story. But he kept coming back to the upper room with them to worship a Jesus he didn't understand or believe in. And because he did, Thomas was there when Jesus one day shows up. And no one was more surprised than Thomas when Thomas himself fell to his knees and said, my Lord and my God, worship. See, Jesus leads us into worship to lead us through worship. And here's another conviction of mine. Jesus leads this church, UPC, us, through worship. Jesus is the head of this church. It's not me, it's not your elders, it's Jesus. And Jesus leads this church, I firmly believe, through worship in this moment right now. By his word and sacrament, Jesus leads his church. And that is good news. And, and, but it means if we want to be a part of what Jesus is doing, if we want to be a part of the miracle of this moment and this new season of ministry, as God has says, I'm going to do a new thing, we need to be here experiencing what, the mystery and the miracle of what happens here. I, I can't explain it, I, but I believe in it. Worship. Jesus is leading this church. You know, I, I need to be here. And some of you know I'm taking a sabbatical uh, next month, and, and, that, and that's important, and I thank you for the opportunity to do that. But I want you to know, I really get my juice here on Sunday, not resting somewhere. It's here. They say we're all crawling out of the pandemic all struggling with challenges to our mental health. We're all navigating rapid cultural change and a, a social toxicity. We're all suffering through challenges in our families. And the Hinman family is not different from any other family. We're going through the same thing. But do you know what has given me strength these last several years to face all that? Do you know where I have found confidence? Right here. 
I think I'm a preacher because the Lord knows one service a Sunday wouldn't be enough for me. <laughs> yeah. I kind of miss five services on Sunday. It does my soul good. I don't, no, I'm just kidding. But let me pause and ask you to think about your vital signs today. Let me, let me invite you to ask yourself this question. How am I gathering with my church family to worship? Would you just think about that for a moment? How am I gathering with my church family to worship? Pause and think, how is worship shaping your life right now? What are your worship practices? Not your intentions, your practices. What actually has been happening recently? And then ask yourself, how would I like to worship Jesus? Uh, what worship practices would you like to shape your life? I mean, you have to come up with your own answer for this. So, so think for a moment. You might even ask the Holy Spirit to bring something to mind. I'd like to encourage everyone in this room to identify one thing that you'll do differently this year that might deepen your worship life. Write that down. In fact, would everyone just pull out a piece of paper, pull out a card, or pull out your phone or something, and, and make a commitment to yourself? You can work on this later today, but I'd like you to start something right now. Jot something down, whatever comes to mind. Commitment to yourself, to Jesus, to this church family, to connect with worship. Here's what I've written down on mine. For me, it's two things, actually. I'm going to be in our sanctuary every Sunday I'm in town, whether I'm preaching or not, in our sanctuary. And secondly, I want to help out with our welcome team in the lobby. So those are, that's, you can hold me accountable to that. What would it be for you? How do you want to gather with your church family to worship? It might be streaming the service once a month. You know, maybe that's, that's the next step for you. It might be moving from live stream to in person. Uh, it might be coming early to sit and pray in the sanctuary. It might be actually singing the songs that you hear other people sing around you or, or coming, coming down front to pray after the service. It might be coming for two hours instead of one. Maybe you worship and then maybe you also join uh, one of our classes or immerse or something, read the Bible. Maybe, maybe you want to start serving and help other people worship. And you'll join the, the choir or a worship team or some other form of service. It might be inviting, inviting a neighbor to join us each month or sending a link or posting one of our shorts in Instagram. Whatever it is, Please write something down. Put it in your phone. Write it in your journal on a pew card. Someplace you'll see it each week. I'm going to give this each week a little bit of assignment. So as I said, by November, uh, you'll have a whole set of five new intentions. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. Let us care for one another. You know, there are actually two sanctuaries in this text. There's one that's above and then there's one below. One is extraordinary, but one is rather plain. It's just referred to as a meeting place, gathering place. And you might understand why people began to neglect it. It was probably just someone's home in Rome or Jerusalem. Probably it was just like a workshop or maybe a courtyard where, I don't know, two dozen believers could gather there and worship Jesus in the first century. It was plain. But here's the insight of the text. When you gather in a sanctuary down here, Jesus leads you into the sanctuary up there, into the extraordinary. And what was true for them is true for us. And this is a lovely sanctuary. Look around the room that we're in right now. It's beautiful. But really, it's pretty plain in here. You know, you're sitting on a wooden bench. There's the squeaky shoe. There's the oily face, as C.S. Lewis says. There's the awkward conversation. There are songs that are definitely not on your playlist. But when we begin to worship in this room, Jesus leads us up into another. You can't see it with your eyes. You can't hear it with your ears. But it's what the Holy Spirit does with your soul. Come, the Spirit says, let us draw near to the place of forgiveness. Just imagine the heavenly sanctuary. We fly through clouds of incense and singing above a gleaming city whose architect and builder is God, above mansions of glory and endless delights, through angels innumerable rejoicing in festal gathering, towards a great throne guarded by cherubim and seraphim calling holy, holy, holy. You cry out, woe is me, for I'm a sinner of unclean lips. But no. This is a place of forgiveness. Come in faith, friend. Come hear a word of good news. Come eat the bread of forgiveness. You are sprinkled clean, washed in the river Jordan, flowing from the throne. Can you see him yet? 
Can you see him advocating for the Father on your behalf? Come to the throne of grace with boldness. Come with confidence. Come, the Spirit says. Let us hold fast to hope. Do you hear that? Is that crying somewhere? Crying? Do you hear the sound of lament and tears? Where does that come from? Is that from earth below? Or is that St. John crying out, who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the scroll of history and discover the meaning? Who can make sense of the senseless suffering and grief? Oh, there's crying. But again, you hear another voice, louder than the first, crying out. Do not weep. See the, the throne. See the lion of Judah. And you look, and there's the throne. But it's not a lion. It's a lamb. It's a wounded lamb. It's the beginning and the end. It's the author and the finisher. It's the redeemer. It's the one who brings life out of death. And now finally you know. You know what the pain was. You know now because you know what it became. And the tears are wiped away from your eye and every eye. You cast your crown into a sea of tears and join the singing with joy. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Come, let us hold fast to hope. Oh, he who has promised is faithful. Come, the Spirit says, let us care for one another. Imagine pressing through that celestial throng and, and every tribe and tongue and people and nation, they part as you walk towards that throne. Who will you see? Who will you recognize? Who might put their hand on your shoulder and turn you around? A grandparent? Or the woman who prayed for you for so many years, you never even knew it? Or that teammate who first talked to you about Jesus? Maybe the guy down the pew and what will you say to them? Thank you. Thank you. Or I love you. A great cloud of witnesses. Here where we are not divided. Here where we're one. Here where we are with one another and for one another. Finally, a great cloud of witnesses cheering, encouraging, provoking one another to love and good deeds. Come, let us care for one another. You know, some people say they've had a near-death experience in, a, in, a, in an ambulance. I know I did not. But every time I come into this room, every time I have a near-life experience, and it makes my soul stronger. You see, when you gather in a sanctuary down here, Jesus leads us into a sanctuary up there, and no one comes back from there unchanged. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, oh, if we could only see with our eyes right now as one day we will see, if we would only touch with our hands as we know someday we will touch your face to be drawn into the mysteries of which your word speaks more fully. Would you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us today, right now, your word, the hearing of your word, and, and the, the table, the, the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup. Lord, you meet us here. We thank you for that. So, so we pray for the year ahead that, that, that each of us would be given from you, just from you, a word about our worship life. Would you speak to us? Would you help us to write something down? Would you help us to commit to something that's the right thing for us, individually and collectively? that we might more fully express the beauty of what you have created here at UPC. We pray in Christ's name, amen.